Okay, hi everybody, welcome. Um, so this is our first official Climate Cafe. Um, this is a collaboration between Cove Park and ACT. We're, we've been appointed as a climate beacon, which means that as a collaboration, we're um, joining our skills of both the scientists and the environmentalists at ACT and the artists and um, cultural organization that is Cove Park. To, to try and um, distill some more information about the rainforests that we have here. So our climate beacon is focusing on Scotland's rainforests, which are mostly found in Argyll. And we're really happy to have Sarah and Julie, who are our colleagues at ACT, who've helped us immensely already. Um, they've got a great wealth of information and experience about the rainforests. Um, so today is our first climate cafe. We've got both Marina Cortha, Marina Curran Culford, and Anne Garrett Ward, who are going to speak to us around topics of biodiversity. So Sarah from ACT is going to introduce them for us. They're going to speak for about maybe thirty minutes each, and we'll have time for discussion afterwards. So with the setup we've got here, we are recording the Zoom so that we can just use it later if there's any questions. We can ask questions to them from the microphone. So if you've got questions afterwards, just let us know. We can come around with the microphone. Um, and they're going to share their screen and share their presentations with us. So I'll hand over to you, Sarah, because you're going to introduce our speakers for us, aren't you? Yeah, thanks very much, Emma. Um, first of all, I'll introduce ACT. ACT being the acronym for Argyll and the Isles Coast and Countryside Trust. And um, we, we cover the whole of Argyll and our mission is to sustainably maintain, enhance and promote the coast and countryside of Argyll and the Isles. Um, we believe that residents, businesses and visitors should all be able to enjoy and, and benefit this wonderful region. And um, so what we do is we work in partnership with communities, public agencies, third sector and private organisations to design and implement projects that make a difference to people and landscapes. We cover quite a range, quite an exciting range of topics, including conservation, climate change, tourism, education and health and well-being. Um, if you get the opportunity to visit our website afterwards, you can get loads more information from there. Um, our objectives are to care for and enhance our unique natural environment, give people opportunities to experience, learn in and be inspired by nature, to encourage investment in our Giles natural capital to support our economy and to increase opportunities for employment, skills development and volunteering. And yes, we, we're collaborating with Cove Park in this exciting um, Climate Beacon, which and they were originally put together by Creative Carbon Scotland as part of the lead up to COP26 and beyond. And now we're beyond and we're still delivering on our project. And the theme for this Climate Cafe is biodiversity, as Emma mentioned. And we're delighted that our first guest speaker is Marina Curran Coltard. And Marina is the local biodiversity officer for Argyll and Butte Council. Um, and she's also an advisor to ACT's board, and she works on a number of different topics um, based on land, freshwater, marine and coastal topics. And she's our resident expert on policy around biodiversity. Um, and along with providing in-house support to development management and strategy planning and technical things. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Marina and Marina, um, please, I think you have to share your screen with us, but if not, we can share it. Could you share it, please? Could you share it, please? Thank you. Are you okay to do that, Emma? Yep, there we Great. go. <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to my presentation on Biodiversity Matters dot 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 to all of us. Uh, as uh, Sarah has very kindly introduced me, I'm the local biodiversity officer for Dial and View Council and it's my privilege today to do a presentation to you at the Cove Cafe this afternoon. I've been involved with um, the Argyll and View Council COP26 
Education Summit last year. And it was certainly an eye opener in terms to the variety and scale of the whole event. Uh, quite awesome to say the least. But one of the things that drew, drew me to <clears throat> COP26 was the fact that we have a beacon at Cove Park, and it's one of the seven beacons. If you move to slide two, please. One of the seven COP26 beacons, and it's a privilege to have it um, at Cove Park on the Roseneath Peninsula in Argyll and Butte. The park and the Argyll and Isles Coast and Countryside Trust, as they are hosting the beacon, are promoting Scotland's temperate rainforest. And from my sins, it's one of those areas that actually um, steeled it from my husband when we used to weekend up here. He's originally from Argyll, was um, the diversity of the, um, the landscape, but also the lichens of bryophytes and the woodlands. And uh, he had me there, so that's why I'm here now. Uh, as, as I say, the beacon will raise awareness of the importance of biodiversity in an inclusive way. And I'm proud to be living and working in such a biodiverse and amazing area with its 23 inhabited islands on the west coast of Scotland. In my presentation, I'll give you a snapshot of the history of biodiversity, provide an insight into our and Butte's biodiversity with some interesting facts, why it matters, what are the threats, and what we're doing for biodiversity, and what we as individuals can do our bit in order to halt the loss and enhance biodiversity, all framed within the climate change agenda. Next slide. So what do we understand about biodiversity? It's the variety of all living things, so we're told, but what does that actually really mean to us bugs on the ground? Well, all will, will be revealed in good time, but firstly, a wee bit of history. By the way, when I was at school, this wasn't where it wasn't about, and that wasn't exactly yesterday. Anyway, the expression of biological diversity was invented by Thomas Lovejoy in 1980, some 42 years ago. It was shortened to biodiversity by Walter G. Rosen in 1985, and it was brought to public attention by Edward O. Wilson in 1986. This term gave rise to the Convention of Biological Diversity, which is still alive and kicking today. And it was adopted at the first Earth Summit in 1996, which was held in Rio de Janeiro. And 196 parties attended and 186 signatories signed up to the convention itself. The convention has three main goals, which remained consistent from those days in 1992 to today. The conservation of biological diversity, the sustainable use of its components, and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from genetic resources. Next slide, please. So what's so special about our in Butte? Um, in terms of total area, our in Butte has just under 700,000 hectares. We've uh, two, uh, 243 designated sites, which are made up of triple SIs, SAC, marine protected areas, Ramsar sites. And currently they cover just under a million hectares and that includes the marine environment. And just a little focus on some of the habitats. Macher, um, we have 24.7 of the Scottish proportion and nearly 19% of the world's resource. Unimproved ground, which we mostly have in our dial, is at 32%. And we support 56% of the world's population of Greenland white fronted goose. Could you imagine those landing on your doorstep, particularly on Isla? I'm sure I'm married knows full well the implications of that. We have over 50% of the rest of the region is a mosaic of uplands, heather moor, peatland, rough grassland, and bracken and scrub. The area of native woodland in Argyll is about 33,000 hectares. This is about 16% of the total woodland area in Scotland, or 4.8% of the total land area of Argyll and Butte. So we quite a substantial amount of woodland. And our woods are amongst the richest habitats for lichens and bryophytes. And obviously our Atlantic temperate rainforest um, certainly falls into that category. We have many of the European protected species on our doorstep, otter, bat, wildcat, water bull, along with a number of important marine uh, uh, animals, including basking shark, mingy whale, dolphin, harbour porpoise, and a variety of commercial fishery. Next slide, please. So what has climate change got to do with biodiversity? <clears throat> 
Well, they're intrinsically interlinked and interdependent. In essence, we really cannot exist without biodiversity. Therefore, it is important that we understand our dependency and how we can help take action and influence change for the better for our long-term sustainability. And sustainability went out of fashion a few years ago. It's back in fashion again because of the climate change and COP26 agendas. Next slide. So what does biodiversity, why does biodiversity matter? In essence, we cannot function without biodiversity. It is in our best interest to maintain and enhance it, as well as use it sustainably, as it provides us with food, fresh and salt water, clothing, medicines, fuel, building materials, and clean air. It matters to us in our dial, as we have some of the best examples of biodiversity in Britain, an accolade we are very proud to have. Biodiversity's contr contribution to our life is not just practical, physical, and utilitarian. It also has a positive effect on our health and well-being and influences our culture. Our land, freshwater, and marine and coastal environments are subject to many types of management, from agri-environment schemes, marine protected areas, international, national, and local designations, as well as river basin and petroleum management to community-led, small-scale, but important activities which contribute to the sustainability of our habitat. Next slide. So what are the threats to biodiversity? In terms of threats, climate change is both as a result of natural processes and changes in our global climate, which has arisen due to human activities that have altered the gaseous composition of the Earth's atmosphere. That's something you should really, you should all know off by heart. As previously stated, climate change and biodiversity are intrinsically linked. If you consider biodiversity as an indicator of climate change, in particular our weather patterns, take our seasons, there doesn't appear to be much demarcation. This has occurred through the effects of global warming due to an increase in CO2 and a weak ozone layer, resulting in high rainfall and associated flooding, and at the other end of the scale, drought, fire, storm events, high snowfall, and some experiencing unseasonal frosty conditions that affect plant growth patterns, breathing times, and soil and rock erosion. Next slide. Right. Further threats relate to invasive non-native species, and these include plant and animal, as well as garden APs. And these are a number uh, one culprit in taking over large tracts of land. In our guide, we have been issues with Rhododendron ponticum, Japanese knotweed, Himalayan balsam, giant hawkweed, skunk cabbage, along with other plants. These can damage, cause damage to a wide range of habitats and species, along with our health. An example of this is the giant hogweed, where it can cause painful blistering of the skin. All in all, invasive non-native species can compromise our biodiversity, our health, as well as our ability to grow food and material supplies. Climate change can encourage invasive non-native species, especially animals, to expand their native range, moving in on habit and native habitat and displacing associated species. An example of this is where grey squirrels can move in on red squirrel habitat and can feed on a wide range of unripened seeds, as well as carry parapox disease, which red squirrels are susceptible to. It is worth reiterating that human influences dominate climate change. So what are we doing to manage the effects of things? Next slide. <clears throat> Over the years, we have delivered a huge amount of habitat and species actions through two local biodiversity action plans. However, we have moved away from individual action plans to embracing the wider scope of the ecosystem approach for freshwater, marina coastal, farm and lowland, upland, woodland, and the built environment with uh, over 180 projects completed and some ongoing to meet our climate change responsibility. We work in partnership with government and non-government agencies in delivering a wide range of biodiversity initiatives. Community projects have been a feature of uh, actions for biodiversity from wetland creation, building bird hives, community awareness raising events, to pump primary projects. And an example of this is the woodland grazing project. Now woodlands and grazing were certainly not happy bedfellows at one stage because those in the woodland side of business, forestry and woodland companies did not favour any kind of animal interaction with their trees. So it was the first in our guide to promote this woodland grazing project. 
and we got funding nationally and it was supported to a, a scheme which Forestry Commission Scotland at the time ran as now Scottish Forestry. Uh, we've also developed um, the See and Learn Pack. Um, it's still to go on the website, but I can send you links when it does. And that is um, covers subjects that are related uh, to the curriculum for excellence. And certainly the kids, um, it allows them to study the coastal and marine environment as well as um, uh, take participate in various activities. Right. And with the local biodiversity action plans, the basis for action through a number of national um, agricultural environmental schemes where farmers, crofters, and landowners implement management plans for a wide range of habitats and species. By adapting their land management to facilitate positive change uh, using the ecosystem approach. Certainly with agri-environment schemes, um, our list um, of priority habitats and species has helped farmers to change their management plans and set aside areas for biodiversity, as well as obviously using the tools of their trade livestock to manage that, those areas. The Council are required also uh, to meet a statutory duty by reporting to the Scottish Government on a triennial mm -hmm. basis. In order to facilitate this duty, the Argyll and Butte uh, Council Biodiversity Action Plan informs what we do and is at the moment under revision. We involve our young people in taking action. For example, 98 schools and nurseries across our dial, both council and other providers are registered with eco schools and a number have green flag status. Our schools are involved in making space for biodiversity in their grounds from wildflower areas to growing food. The key aims of eco schools could be summarised as helping to support climate change through biodiversity care and plant energy efficiency, global citizenship, healthy living, litter, taking account to reduce litter in their local area and beyond, marine, protecting rivers, canals, lakes, etc. School grounds, enhancing their learning environments, transport, travelling in an environmentally friendly manner. Uh, we've all done walking to school and cycling to school. Uh, waste, um, refusing, reducing, reusing, repairing and recycling. Um, water, protecting our most important resource. And indeed, our latest publication has helped in some way to promote food growing under our community food growing strategy, which reflects climate change agenda by encouraging people to grow their own food, therefore reducing food miles and much more of our community food growing, growing spaces to contribute to biodiversity, climate change adaptation, reducing the carbon footprint, community places, um, making places for outdoor relaxation and recreational activities environmental education, improved health and well-being, which is even more important uh, now than ever, embracing local character, education, um, upskilling and enterprise and addressing inequalities. Uh, number 10. Oh, oh, sorry, moving on. I beg your pardon, I've skipped the slide. Uh, I beg your pardon. Go back. That's number ten. What what we're doing to provide a very the second slide. Uh, agricultural scheme fine. Done. Right. Okay. Um, it should be, yes, move on from there, I think. <clears throat> Cover threat. Um, so we have eco schools, community food growing, local development plan. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Uh, moving on to sustainable development, which is defined as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The local development plan sets the policy and maps land for development, whereas development management implements the local development policy plan through planning applications which successfully meet our policy under natural environment with, with development impacts on 
habitats and species under biodiversity designated sites, um, a, a local nature conservation sites, trees and woodland, water quality and the environment, green networks, areas of wild land, geodiversity, and the protection of soil beach resources. Along with pre application advice in terms of ecological studies and conditions relating to pre start ecological checks and for larger projects, construction environmental management plans, along with the appropriate landscape design plans encompassing biodiversity. And these are normally through native tree planting, wetland features, and green work network connectivity, uh, linking uh, to other wildlife corridors and the wider countryside. We provide information and advice to developers through our biodiversity technical zone. And certainly in terms of influences on our land and development, development policy and our local development yeah. policy plan certainly influence quite a lot of positive work in terms of biodiversity and climate change. In relation to development, renewable energy and climate change go hand in hand. We have about 120 active installations with more in the pipeline from wind farms, community turbines, hydro schemes, micro hydro schemes, wood fuel, tidal, wave energy, and solar power, power where our Guyland Youth Council have installed a large amount of solar panels on public buildings. An example of this is on our school roof. Moving on to uh, carbon capture, peatlands are important, along with the restoration, their restoration to help address climate change. And peatlands are a type of wetland which are among the most valuable ecosystems on earth. They are really important for people. For example, most of Scotland's drinking water is filtered through peatlands. Healthy peatlands produce clean water which requires fewer chemicals to treat. They are critical for conserving global biodiversity, minimising flood risk and helping address climate change. Peatlands cover almost cover, uh, cover a quarter of Scotland about 1.7 million hectares, storing 1.6 billion tonnes of carbon, the equivalent of an estimated 140 years of Scottish emissions. In terms of biodiversity, peatlands are home to birds that like to nest in open ground, such as the curlew, golden plover and hen harrier. Red deer, mountain hares, lizards, amphibians, butterflies, toads, insects eating sundew plants are favourite. Uh, lichens and bryophytes and a host of invertebrates also thrive on peatlands. So there's really hoaching with wildlife. <clears throat> In terms of restoration, the Peatland Action Fund has already put uh, over 25,000 hectares of peatland on the road to recovery. And while all progress is welcome, it also highlights the scale of the task ahead. This is why the funding provided by the Scottish Government and other financial incentives are vital to incentivize landowners in restoring their peatlands. Uh, a new fund is the Nature uh, Restoration Fund, offers organisations an opportunity to enhance, restore and create habitats. We in Argyll and Youth Council have developed a suite of projects to enhance our estate. And that's one of the, uh, in terms of the guidance, we have to spend, spend it on council land. And we've developed a range of tree planting, making homes for nature, habitat restoration through invasive non-native species eradication, and subsequent planting of a variety of tree and shrub species, along with some wetland works in terms of project um, allocation. Next slide. <clears throat> in terms of agri-environment schemes, they help to deliver biodiversity uh, benefits through Scottish biodiversity strategy. And as previously mentioned, take account of the local biodiversity action plan by supporting appropriate management for vulnerable and iconic species and habitats, strengthening ecological networks, controlling invasive non native species, and enhancing the management of vulnerable, of, um, enhancing the, manage, the condition of protected nature sites, all contributing to Scotland's world leading climate change targets by reducing greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and securing carbon stores in peatlands and other organic soils. And these result in meeting our obligations to improve water quality under the Scotland River Basin Management Plan by reducing diffuse pollution, controlling flooding through natural flood risk management, support nature friendly farming through organic farming, preserve the historic environment and improve public access to enjoy what biodiversity has on offer. Other management is commonly led through 
community woodlands. We have 16 community woodlands with some new ones at the planning stages. Woodlands in and around towns play an important role in absorbing carbon, keeping us cool and sheltered. I know there is a trend now for urban forests, which brings me to the topic of green space and green networks. These are designed and managed to reduce energy use in our day-to-day -day lives. Well-designed green spaces can include the use of street trees and trees and shrubs near buildings. These can help manage temperature screens. This can help reduce heating usage in winter and as applicable air conditioning in summer. These spaces and networks also contribute to a place for wildlife and allow them to move from one area to another. Um, our, uh, anyway, our Gaia View Council are actively promoting its climate friendly Argyle initiative. The council is taking action in different ways across all services to create a climate friendly Argyle View so we can support the planet and the resources on which we all depend on to live. Here's an insight into some of the actions we're taking to develop sustainable, sustainable ways of working and living. Our Island View Council has reduced carbon emissions by 27% over the last five years. We promote uh, becoming climate friendly our Island View. We're investing 1.2 million in action to save energy and uh, deliver progress in becoming a net zero carbon emissions organisation by 2045. We have signed up to the National Household Recycling Charter. We develop local actions to support national initiatives. Our local development plan sets out how the council will deliver sustainable development. Again, referring back to some of the positive sides in terms of forward planning and delivery through development management. We are taking, we are developing walking and cycling routes and our young people are getting involved playing their part through eco schools and other youth teams. We've developed a decarbonisation plan which sets out actions which are working to deliver for climate friendly Argyle. Our approach is based on addressing six overall themes. Waste, energy and water consumption, tra transport emissions, preparing and adapting for impacts of climate change, offsetting our emissions through partnership and innovation, and tell us about it and encourage community to do their bit and uh, hashtag climate friendly Argyle. Having given you a snapshot of some of the work we're doing, it is up to us individuals to become a champion for biodiversity to uh, address climate change. Next slide, please. <clears throat> firstly, excuse me, moment. firstly, to put things in perspective, we cannot hold the loss of biodiversity without factoring in how we can tackle climate change. But it's equally impossible to tackle climate change without halting the loss of biodiversity. Protecting and restoring related habitats and species that are reflected in what we group together as ecosystems. These can help us reduce the extent of climate change and cope with its impacts. I've outlined what's happening in our dialogue and butte, but as individuals we can help by doing our bit for biodiversity through becoming a citizen scientist. The opportunity to increase knowledge on one or more or a range of topics can open up a whole new world and make a walk into an adventure. The information that the citizen scientist provides is invaluable to scientists. Volunteers can generate much larger sample sizes and are far broader geographical coverage than otherwise be possible. There are lots of seasonal counts, whether it's for birds, butterflies, bats and other mammals or plants, so why not get involved? Information is usually posted on the World Wide Web by lots of organizations. Next page. There are lots of opportunities to learn about invasive non native species, with the council running a campaign for what's for the garden saves the garden, and applying good hygiene practices through biosecurity measures such as check clean and dry, particularly those obviously involved in water sports, checking their equipment and making sure they're not carrying any nasties about. And these help reduce the risk of spreading invasive non native species and disease. A number of community groups have taken up the challenge of dealing with invasive non-native species in their areas. And there's lots of examples from those uh, hand pulling um, Himalayan balsam to uh, cutting and dealing, trying to eradicate um, Rhododendron quantica. Next slide, please. If you have not done so already, why not develop a, a green conscience? From your purchasing habits to what you wear to recycling, sourcing local produce, 
growing your own and using green travel along with contributing to place making by using biodiversity to enhance your garden ultimately or local environment. For those already doing these things, please continue with the good work and encourage others to make simple changes on a local level. These changes can really make a difference. And my final slide. I would like to finish with a quote from our leader, the Council, Councillor Robin Curry. And he said, we all share one planet and rely on its resources to live our lives. We all have a duty, therefore, to look after it and ensure that what we leave it intact, uh, leave it intact and sustainable for our younger and future generations. Thank you for logging in. Uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And finally, I'm a fan of the bee. Um, be a beacon for climate change by doing your bit for biodiversity. Thank you very much. Hello, Marina. Oh, thank, you thank you, Marina. That was that was great. And um, uh, there's an opportunity now if anybody has any questions. I think we wanted to ask if anybody does have questions, could they please first just introduce themselves um, before they ask the question? That would be great. Yeah. Can I can I ask as a biodiversity officer how much influence you have over planning regulations or over planning um, applications uh, where there's natural habitat? So recently near here, the um, the uh, application was turned down eventually because of the um, Atlantic rainforest at um, Port and Capel. But there's another a number of other <clears throat> planning applications in in this area where there's going to be a loss of biodiverse habitat. Um, I know that you've got particular restrictions as to what you're allowed to to, um, to submit on at the moment. Um, I just wondered if that legislation is going to increase. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't catch your name. Sorry, sorry, Angela Anderson. Plus Angela. Angela. Good afternoon, Angela. Thank you for your question. Um, in terms of my role in, in development management planning applications, I'm a, a, an in-house consultee, uh, but I also work with Nature Scott, who are statutory consultee on um, uh, planning applications. Obviously, they have a restriction. They're only interested in uh, things of national importance rather than local importance, but we still have discussions. Uh, in terms of my role, um, I, I examine um, each uh, of the, I, I usually work with major applications, except some smaller ones that are brought in near um, designated sites, and provide advice to the um, my, my the case officer, the planning officer, in terms of what's requirement required in, in terms of ecological studies, and these uh, the ecological studies cover uh, habitats and species, but there's also a separate study for um, any European. Uh, protected species as well as um, uh, ornithological interest in birds, for example. Uh, also with bigger developments, um, they're meant to refer to our biodiversity technical note in terms of advice and frame their application around that. Um, it, it, it's always a difficult one in terms of my role. Um, as I say, I provide the necessary tools for the, uh, ask for the necessary surveys for a case officer or a team to be able to come up with the, the right conclusion in terms of whether a planning application is allowed to go ahead or not. But ultimately, it is a political decision. Uh, officers can only promote either on a ne negative or a positive way, uh, but eventually it goes to uh, the, the planning committee and their all political um, representatives, your, your councillors. And it is a political decision ultimately. I hope that answers your question. Does anybody else have questions? Um, I was interested, Marina, in what you were saying about um, the non invasive species. And I wonder if you could, I know that rhododendron is obviously a hot topic when it comes to the Atlantic rainforests. I wonder if you could elaborate a bit about what um, Argyll and Butte are doing 
about rhododendron invasion? Um, we don't have a great deal of um, invasive non-native species in terms of our land management. Um, we, uh, in, but we do promote um, through the control of invasive non-native species uh, as a council per se. We do some control where it's necessary in terms of areas that we're responsible for in terms of management. But um, it, it is an, an ongoing fight. And I suppose from a landowner point of view, uh, every landowner has a responsibility to ensure that they're managing it in a way that suppresses it, stops it from spreading and allows other species to come through. And I think perhaps one of the bad things when you refer to it in the Atlantic rainforest is that some landowners don't manage rhododendron or try to uh, reduce its impact and allow for natural regeneration uh, to happen. So it, it's, it's one of those things that I suppose with landowner responsibility, uh, it's almost um, has to go to an extreme level before they actually do something and then it offers opportunities in other ways. So uh, it, it's, it's unfortunate that they don't get it. Some do. There's been a lot of funding for um, uh, the, the control of rhododendron ponticum, uh, particularly, but it's the follow up. It's the, it, 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 is, it is a cultural thing. You have to keep on top of it. It's not just one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And it is a part and parcel of the management of a woodland or management of, um, for example, a Glen, um, and, and Julie is familiar with this, of Glen Creeran. There's been a huge amount of work done by forestry estate uh, and also a private landowner. But also we moved it into people's gardens as well. And we got funding to, re um, to remove rhododendron ponticum from people's gardens so reducing the impact there's no point in the landowner you know removing all the rhododendron and, and somebody's private garden is hoaching with it as a seed source so these things have to work in tandem with each other and I think we we're, we're getting there with it um, it wasn't an easy task uh, to get people to sign over to getting rid of a good proportion of the shrubs in their garden which happened to be invasive so it has been a difficult one, but it's it's doable. Um, and and uh, perhaps uh, Julie Young would would like to elaborate elaborate a bit more. But uh, uh, it is, as I say, it is a task that sometimes is not a priority for landowners. Depends where it is and how accessible it is. And um, there's lots of issues around uh, topography and access. And to be honest with you, if you're if you have to get on a rope. You need to have a steeplejacks license now. Um, you know, there's no such thing as abseiling down a rock and taking off rhododendron ponticum. You have to be able to climb a church spire literally to do that. So the rules have changed, but it, it shouldn't be um, a barrier to controlling, you know, particularly around the edges and making sure that it doesn't start creeping onto other areas of land, which is important in terms of habitat type and, and obviously the species they support. Thank you. That was a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Maureen. I hope you don't mind me. Uh, no, no. <laughs> but, but just, um, but just to say, just realising it's such a massive issue, um, invasives and particularly rhododendron in, in our gallery. That is actually one of the reasons that uh, our trust was established was a, a recognition that um, it was too much for any agency or community or individual to do on their own. So in order to get a kind of collective response, they, um, they established our trust, which was, uh, you know, initially a sort of meeting of minds between Nature Scott and Argyll and Butte Council and NHS Highland and um, Forestry Commission, as it was then, and also community members. So that, um, so I would say probably the council's leading response to invasives was to establish act, give us the responsibility. Thank you, Julie. Any, any other questions in the room? I'll move over. Hi, I'm Lizzie Rose. Um, I was just wondering, it's quite focused. There was a little bit in one of the slides, it's all been quite focused on the land. And I don't know whether that's just because this is about the rainforest, but I'm just wondering about 
the biodiversity of our seas and uh, how much influence people have over that, because in Argyll and Butte, the number of fish farms and trawling is still going up. So the biodiversity, we can see the stuff on the land, it's really visible and really um, immediate for us to see, but the biodiversity of the seas is still appalling because we're still allowing more and more fish farms to pollute the waters of Argyll and Butte, and that's still going up. And I know that's political, but it'd be nice to see a little bit more about that maybe. Um, there was one slide about trawling, but we have, as humans, we're having a huge impact on the biodiversities of our seas, and that matters just as much, I would have said. It's just it's invisible because it's under the water. So I was just wondering if there's a bit more anyone could uh -huh. add in on that of what Argyll and Butte are doing to try and counteract some of that. Thanks. Yes. Um, I Thank you for your question, Liz. Uh, in terms of our Gallant Butte, we're actually working in partnership with um, Nature Scott and um, we formerly are SNH. <laughs> uh, I have to sort of think about these things, but um, and also other partners as well, non government agencies uh, plus agencies, SIPA as well, in terms of marine protected areas and management plans have been uh, drafted for them. And there is a programme under MAR plan. Um, I've been involved with that. And it's about, uh, there is a process and a strategy for uh, further community engagement. Um, not only those that are, are using the marine environment, but in terms of tourism and recreation as well. So there is a series of events coming up later in the year. Obviously with COVID, two plus years has kind of, you know, had a dent in that programme. But um, there is a management plans for these marine protected areas. And certainly um, it, it, it is within the capacity to, to actually manage them in a way that's positive for, for biodiversity. And certainly in terms of obviously fin fish farming and aquaculture are, are contentious issues. And um, if, if you look at the map of Scotland, they're happening on the west coast rather than the east coast, and one has to consider why that is. And I think perhaps uh, some of the bigger rivers will, will, are a good hint in that in relation to that. But we do look after our our, our wild salmonids and work with the um, the fish farm companies in order to monitor, particularly sea lice, which is a contentious issue. Um, there is, it is highly regulated in terms of what they can and can't do. And um, looking at some applications there recently, um, the, the whole process of managing fish farms, the way they monitor, the type of equipment they're using and, and the way they are collecting waste actually bows better. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it bows better for the future of the biodiversity around it. Also, where the fishing farms are placed as well, they're, they're not in um, very, um, you know, inactive waters. In other words, there's a lot of current going on. And I know from years ago, there was one fish farm, it was in the wrong place, it was removed because the fish were getting fat. There wasn't, wasn't enough water current in order to keep them fit. So they are moving out um, further out to sea. Um, but on, on saying that, um, they, they are very well aware of their impact on the environment, but they are making an effort to, of, to manage that and reduce their, their impact. But it's, they are highly regulated. And, and I'm just speaking from merely um, somebody that doesn't have a, a great uh, deal of uh, knowledge in that field, but from what I've been reading, it's certainly, uh, there is a change of culture that is the West Coast is not just to be dismissed as we can do anything we like. There is, there are the rules and regulations and certainly they are being tightened up. It's, it's not an easy thing to cite a fish farm anywhere on the west coast of Scotland. But the, as I say, people will have their opinions and like them or not, um, the, there is a higher policy there that dictates that. And unfortunately, um, sometimes we have to go along with it and other times we don't. So it's just the way I suppose life is in general, that we do have to consider all options. And in terms of people and employment, there is the economic side and there's the food side as well. So we have to try and balance a whole lot of things. My spinning plates are no longer, you know, breakable, they're plastic. And, and that's, 
And that's the way we, we work. We try and balance and keep things in, in proportion and, and that they're in the right place. But we do get a lot of help in terms of our statutory consultees. And these are in-house experts. We have Marine Scotland, we have CEPA, we have Nature Scotland. So we're not doing these things on our own. We have that level of support in order to make sure that the decisions are the right one. But I said, it doesn't always appease those that are living here or otherwise. And, you know, I can only apologize for that. But again, it is politically driven. And often that's, that's the case it's out with our hands. These things can be put up to the government to make a final decision, as we've known in, previous, in some previous cases. But it is unfortunate that some of the information can be quite old and the newer information might give a little bit more detail in terms of the way things are being managed and improvements have been made in order to reduce the impact. But there is certainly a lot more scope for work to be done in terms of uh, improving our wild salmonid interests, but also our habitat interests and particularly there's a focus now on seagrass beds and making sure that our kelp forests are remain remain intact so that there is that that sort of working in unison rather than against and i suppose the culture in the sea has always been take and not put something back we're we're in, into a step change of putting something back and i think that's a very important thing to watch out for in the future thank you for your question and that's pretty good thank you um so our next speaker is Anne Harrod Ward, my colleague at ACT, and she um, is ACT's Peatland Conservation Officer for our project on Isla, which is called the Collaborative Action for the Natura Network. And that's a consortium of 11 partners working to save peatlands and wetlands across Ireland, Northern Ireland and Scotland. And Anne Harrod's role is to provide technical skills and advice, including habitat monitoring and developing conservation action plans in the delivery of that CAN project on Isla. And um, I'm sure she's, well, she's going to tell us more about it. So welcome Anne Harrod and over to you. Great, thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Emma and Cove Park for having me. Um, Emma, I don't know if you're all right to share my slides. Mm -hmm. That's all right. <laughs> I can see all my notes now, but Sarah's done a great job of introducing right. me, so I don't really need them. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Right. So, yes, as Sarah said, my name's Ang Harrod Ward, and I'm the uh, CAN Conservation Officer at ACT. And yeah, I'll be talking more about the CAN project and the work that we do to protect peatland sites and their biodiversity. So next slide, please. Uh, Sarah has already introduced what CAN uh, stands for, the bit of a mouthful, the Collaborative Action for uh, Nature Network. And uh, yeah, as she said, we're one of 11 partners working across Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland and Scotland. And that's to improve the condition of protected peatland habitats, among other things, and also to support priority species such as the hen harrier and the marsh fritillary butterfly, which we've got a nice picture of just there. So on Isla, we mainly work on SACs, which are special areas of conservation designated for the marsh fritillary and also for blanket bog habitat. So our project monitors these sites and works to improve their condition. And this involves addressing threats to the bog, such as rhododendron pomsicum, which we've heard a bit about and you will be hearing a lot more about <laughs> uh, with us. So we also carry out bird and butterfly surveys to monitor these important populations on the sites, as well as habitat surveys as a kind of a health check for these sites as well. And all this information eventually gets brought together into a conservation action plan. And that's then given to the land, landowner. So that's kind of a lowdown on everything that we've learned about the site, what we've done and what we would suggest to be done in the future to continue to care for these sites. So next slide, please. Here we go. So I thought, well, why are we focusing on bogs? And one of the main things is, as Marina said, they are full of life. Um, here, 
we've got a variety of plants, insects, birds, reptiles, and as Maureen was saying, her favourite, the round leaf sundew, which is one of my favourites as well, which is on the, the top left there. Uh, that's a really interesting little plant. It's carnivorous, so it eats insects. And you can just kind of see there's like little red tendrils coming out at the end of each round uh, lobe there. And those are sticky and they catch the insects then, and then that's how they feed on them. We've also got other birds such as the curlew there, and I wish I'd put a picture now of the, the green and white fronted goose that uh, Marina also mentioned because uh, they are all over the bogs here on Isla uh, and really nice to see. Uh, other insects like magpie moth, which we've got uh, a picture of there sitting on some heather, and moth, not butterfly, even though it flies in the day and looks very, very pretty. But I think that's quite a nice one to show that not all moths are boring. <laughs> They're quite colourful. Uh, you could just about see it in the grass there in Adder. We have plenty of those on the bogs and definitely it scares the life out of me sometimes because you're just walking along doing a survey and you nearly step on something that moves and quickly run the other direction. <laughs> Uh, and last of all, we've just got a picture there of a fox moth caterpillar, which I think is always just really nice striking caterpillar. So those are just examples of some of the biodiversity that we have on these bogs and one of the reasons why we want to protect them. Uh, next slide, please. But it's not just the biodiversity of the bogs that are important, but it's their carbon storage. Uh, so because under the surface of these bogs there is a layer of peat and if you've not really heard of peat that much before although marina did a great job of talking about peatland restoration uh, it's very carbon rich soil and we've got some of the same facts marina uh, it stores a lot of carbon it's uh, peatlands only cover about three percent of the world yet that three percent stores more carbon than all the vegetation of the planet combined so that is a lot of carbon in these bogs uh, and in Scotland they are thought to store about 1.7 billion tons 1.6 billion tons so that is yet yeah, very very important to protect these then in our battle against climate change but a bit more about the peat then so how does it form and uh, that's all down to the sphagnum moss so healthy bogs are covered in sphagnum moss, which we've got a picture there, and that is really brilliant, uh, beautiful colours that these mosses can have. This I think the the one thing about bogs is from a distance they don't look very interesting and just look a bit wet and oh not much going on there. But it's when you get close up that you really start to see see the life. So yeah, these brilliant coloured mosses, and it's when these mosses start to die off and the vegetation can't be completely broken down because the bo bogs are so wet and acidic. And so this sphagnum moss ends up like piling up on top of each other and then new moss grows on top and it all starts to compress. And all of these kind of dying mosses then hold on to the carbon that they gained as they were growing. And it's all these layers then that form the peat. But this is a really, really slow process. It takes about a thousand years to grow one meter of peat. So that's about one millimeter of peat a year. It's a very, very slow process. So to keep this carbon in the ground, then we want to keep this nice layer of sphagnum moss on top. And you can see in this other picture I have here, you can see the peat is exposed. So it's that really dark, muddy looking soil. And that is not great for carbon storage because as it meets the air, it starts to oxidize and releases that carbon into the atmosphere. So we want to be keeping that nice layer of sphagnum moss over the top and we don't want exposed bits of peat like this. Right, next slide, please. All right, rhododendron ponticum. This is uh, another one of the, the bad things we find out on the bog. And also I feel like it's kind of common ground between us and what's going on in the rainforest. Because although most of this is about peatlands, we do have a lot of uh, kind of connections about trying to uh, maintain and restore the habitat and biodiversity both between bogs and, and the rainforest. So the main threat that we've been addressing in the CAM project on these peatlands is rhododendron ponticum. As we've heard, it's a non-native invasive plant and uh, yeah, it's spread throughout um, Argyle and uh, yeah, it's a threat to both of our bogs and the native rainforest. So next slide, please. 
we go. But why is it such a problem? And so there's a number of reasons why it's badly affecting the bogs here on Isla and, and across Argyle. And first of all, it's because it dries out the bogs and soaks up the moisture needed to sustain those sphagnum mosses and to form peat. It outcompetes the surrounding vegetation, including the mosses. You can see a little rhododendron seedling there poking up through the mosses on the, in that picture just there. And we need those mosses to have a healthy peat forming bog. There's also an indication that once rhododendrons established, it releases a chemical that makes it harder for plants to set seed around it, which just kind of continues its domination of an area. Uh, it harbors less biodiversity than our native plants. It's quite toxic to many insects and herbivores. Uh, so it supports less biodiversity than the, the native plants that we would be wanting to see in these areas. And it also just spreads so quickly. <laughs> uh, it can take over entire woodlands, as I'm sure people have seen. And uh, quite often it's these bases in the woodlands that allow it to access out onto bogs. And those woodlands are the seed sources then, and they just march out on the bogs. You can see in this picture there, the rhododendron has started just, just off the picture there and is spreading right out onto the bog. So one flowering bush can produce thousands of seeds, which are light and spread by wind. And Isla is quite a windy place if you haven't been here before. So these seeds can travel really far. Uh, right, next slide, please. So what are we doing in the CAN project to tackle this rhododendron problem? So we have identified protected bogs that were suffering from an invasion from this rhododendron. So this meant we first had to map out how much rhododendron was there across the sites and the size of those plants, and then designate priority areas that we wanted to tackle first. This often meant uh, addressing the seed source, which on all of the sites we're working on happened to be a woodland bordering the bog. So that means, although we're working out on the bog to remove rhododendron there, we've also been kind of going to the edges of sites and addressing the woodland. So after this uh, mapping process, we then go about appointing contractors and the work can start because there's a lot of rhododendron here and way more than I can tackle myself uh, in ACT. So the rhododendron is usually treated one of three ways in our projects, and that's through spraying, chopping it down, or stem injection. So here in the picture, we have an example of stem injection. And you can see uh, this stems are drilled into, they're quite close to the ground, like below the lowest branch. And then a herbicide and dye mixture is inserted into uh, those holes. Then you can see the, the blue on the picture there from where it's gone in. And that's just to make sure, you know, that we've covered everything. We can, we can see where we've been. So we trialed this stem injection method on one site for the past two years, and we've had a really good success rate. Both us and the landowners are really happy with how it's looking. So you can see in the picture there as well, the kind of the line where the contractors had gotten up to and then had to stop and would be starting again later on. So the rhododendron on the right hand side has had time to die down. And just the comparison between the two, like, I love this photo because it's so stark, like you can tell the difference straight away. So the woodland is completely choked out with rhododendron on the left there. And then on the right, where it's died down, you can see that nothing was able to grow below them. It is, it's bare ground, it's dead leaves, and that was it. You just had the tall trees that had managed to grow up above the rhododendron. So all the undergrowth, plants, everything that should be found in woodlands aren't there because this rhododendron has choked it out. And in this case, then, we're leaving the rhododendron once we've stem injected it to, uh, to die down in place. So by clearing the rhododendron in the woodland, we're helping to return it to a healthier, more biodiverse habitat so that these other species that should be there have a chance to come through. And then we're also removing the threat to the bog at the same time as we're tackling any of the plants that have moved out there. Right, next slide, please. So the thing with rhododendron is you really need to be in for the long haul when you're trying to treat it. Um, 
so we're coming into our fourth year of treatment at one site and still tackling plants. You can see some of the, the survivors, although they're kind of scraggly looking, they're still there. And if we leave them, they will start to grow back and the problem will still be there. So they've got really long lasting and resilient seed banks, rhododendron, and seedlings will just keep popping up. So unfortunately, our project is coming to an end this September. So although we can't continue on the treatment ourselves, we have been working to help uh, land managers to continue on the work now that we've kind of taken out the bulk of the problem. So this involves doing another rhododendron mapping survey this upcoming spring so that the land managers know exactly how much is left, where it is, and what needs to be done to treat it. We've also been providing training across the islands so that people can tackle the rhododendron problem themselves with all the necessary tickets and knowledge required. Right, next slide, please. So moving on to another aspect of the CAN project then, now that I've had my moan about rhododendron, <laughs> um, is the monitoring. So we're looking more into the biodiversity found on the bog habit, habitats that we're trying to improve. Um, we're very lucky on Isla to be home to amazing bird species and the marsh fertility butterflies I mentioned before. So as part of our monitoring, we contracted the Isla Natural History Trust to carry out three years worth of surveying for us to get kind of a snapshot of how certain populations are faring across our peatland sites. Next slide, please. Go. So we'll start off with the birds. Uh, the bird monitoring was carried out in the spring on all of our peatland sites, and that consists of three visits spread out across the breeding season, with surveyors then walking across the site, identifying everything they can hear, everything that's singing, and where those birds are. So these walkover surveys are also a great chance to spot other interesting residents of peatlands, uh, such as butterflies, lizards, adders, dragonflies, and much more all reported as well. As part of these bird surveys, we also had hen harrier vantage point watches, looking out for potential breeding hen harrier activity. And we were really pleased to find that the hen harriers were breeding either on or very closely, just annoyingly over the border of a couple of our sites. But that was four out of six of our sites had uh, breeding hen harrier activity. And that was consistently across the three years. So that is really heartening to see because uh, the hen harriers had a really tough time of it. Uh, it's a bird that has been in serious decline and is faring even worse in England than in Scotland. So we're, we're quite proud on Isla to have you know, a fairly good population of these and want to continue to monitor them. So other birds as well, we've got plenty of highlights, um, wide range of species as well, but skylarks definitely uh, scored the most points. They're the, the most prolific on our sites. But it's actually so nice in the spring to be out on the bogs when they're really starting to come alive. They're just humming the Skylark song during the day. And then if you happen to venture out in the evening, hear the snipe drumming, it's all yeah, really atmospheric. Uh, some of our deeper bog pools on one site this year even housed red-throated divers, which was really nice to see. And then, you know, kind of leading their chicks about on the water was, yeah, it was lovely. Uh, so we had a total of 61 species seen on sites across the three years, uh, but it's quite hard to pick up any real changes in populations over three years, unfortunately. But this acts as a really nice snapshot into what and roughly how much is using these sites. So the information gathered here will also be shared with relevant bodies such as the BTO, British Trust for Ornithology, uh, because I. I feel there's no use gathering all this information if it's not shared with other people to learn from and to you know, help other projects and you know, feed into uh, other, other research that's going on. And as Marina was talking about citizen science, you know, it all comes together and all, all information is worth gathering, but it needs to, be, needs to be shared about with everyone. Right, so that is the birds. If we move on to the next slide, please. Uh, we come on to the marsh fritillaries. So I'm a bit biased. These are my favourite butterflies, so I could talk all day about the marsh fritillaries, but they're absolutely gorgeous. I always think they're like a, like a stained glass window with the orange on their wings. 
But our marsh artillery monitoring was carried out on five sites across Isla with two different types of surveys used across the year. But why are we focusing on the marsh artilleries? Uh, and that's because they're unfortunately facing decline across the UK. They're a UK biodiversity action plan priority species, and they're only found in pockets along the west coast of the UK, with Isla being a very important stronghold for these species. They have a really unique life cycle that allows us to carry out these two different types of surveys that I was mentioning. So first of all, we have a walkover to count flying adults in June, and then another walkover in September to count their larval webs. Because when the caterpillars hatch and start to grow, they congregate and spin these really dense webs, which we've got a picture of just there. And they can be quite big, like bigger than, bigger than your hand. And these webs are a lot easier to count than butterflies because he's not dependent on weather. You're not chasing butterflies across a bog, um, trying to see was that actually a marsh fertility or was it something different? And it also gives a good indication of breeding success that you can see these webs. A lot of the webs may contain over a hundred caterpillars just in one go. So yeah, they're, they're quite interesting. Most years, a couple dozen butterflies are seen on our sites with maybe up to 50 webs on a site. However, last year was an absolute bumper year for the marsh artillery. We had over 150 butterflies seen on just one site. It was our best site. It's always been our best site, but still 150 butterflies and almost 400 webs were counted then in the autumn later on. So these kinds of numbers are amazing and we think a potential record for all of the west coast. We still are waiting for verification of that. But yeah, just really, really great numbers last year. Although marsh fertilities are definitely known for their kind of up and down population cycles. So using our data from the past three years, it looks as if the population is on an upward trend at the minute but that may well crash down again soon. And again, because our project is finishing, we aren't able to continue monitoring to see what happens next, but uh, we're hoping that a longer term project is soon going to be put in place. That is one of the frustrating aspects of fairly short term projects is, you know, you do all this work and then it's like, oh, could we just do another year, another year? We want to keep going with it all. Right, next slide, please. Okay, on to the habitat surveys. Uh, so this was a lot of my summer uh, last year, was conducting these habitat surveys, which is the herbivore impact assessments and site condition monitoring. So the HIAs look at the level of grazing occurring on a site. And bogs can be quite delicate and have quite low thresholds of how much grazing they can sustain, hence why we want to do these uh, surveys. So I spent time traipsing across all of our sites, sometimes in the sun, like in this picture, but other times not in the sun. Um, and what I would do then is set out a quadrat, which you can see in the picture, and uh, measure indicators then of grazing. So that involves looking at heather and how much of the newer shoots have been munched on, uh, looking at vegetation height, um, hoof prints, if they're there or not, any like deer poo, that kind of thing, because on Isla, deer are one of the main grazing threats to these bogs. Now, at the same time as these HIAs, I also carried out site condition monitoring. So this looks at the habitat more like an overall picture, and it's like the, the proper like health checkup. So one of the things this includes is peak depth surveys using the kind of orange equipment you can see in the photos. And how this works is I did have a video to show you, but it didn't kind of translate across well with the PowerPoint. So now you just get to listen to me explain it. But so how these work is you have many one meter length sections that can all screw together. So what I do is I start off with one section, push it into the ground using the handle, unscrew the top, add another section and keep going until I basically hit the bottom of the peak. And you know you've hit the bottom when you just can't go any further. It jolts to a stop. Uh, so then I take them all back out again and measure the length of the peak probe and see how deep the peak is. So some of our sites then had uh, peaks kind of one, two meters, but also up to like five and a half and seven meters deep. 
So if we go back to what I was mentioning before about uh, peat formation and how long it takes to form peat, we get a rough indicator then of how long these bogs have been about. So say the, the seven meter deep peat, that's about 7,000 years. So these bogs have been around for quite a long time. Uh, Isla has also in the past year had uh, quite a lot of other peat depth surveys going on with organizations such as Peatland Action and they actually found uh, the deepest peat on record so far in all of Scotland on Isla and that was nearly 14 meters deep so yeah very very deep peat bogs out there. So some of the other things then that I was measuring in the site condi condition monitoring was uh, like cover of sphagnum, kind of getting an idea of, you know, how much exposed peat there might be. Um, and again, looking at vegetation height, presence of invasive species, if there's any rhododendron that is, you know, creeping out onto the bogs, that kind of thing. So all this then gets collated together into one big look at the bog, kind of a, a, a landscape scale, because I would do many of these, these quadrats all across the bogs. Uh, right, so if we go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So all of this data then gets collated in to help advise me when I'm writing conservation action plans for these sites. And this is basically uh, an advice packet for landowners and managers. So uh, they quite often find this information very useful. They know their land, but it's, it's really great to have all this information collated together in, into one handy uh, kind of package there. So this previous year, one of the landowners actually used the bird data when they were applying for their agri-environment schemes and that kind of thing. So yeah, it, it feels good when the data you're gathering isn't interesting just for yourself, but also has practical applications like that. And again, coming back to the, uh, the, the woes of having a short-term project, it's hard to make lasting impacts on habitats and biodiversity, but I feel these, these caps are a way of addressing that and kind of giving a bit of a, a legacy um, when you're not able to kind of completely see projects, you know, completely eradicate rhododendron, say, on a site. So, you know, we want to see this work continued so these caps provide like a guide forward for landowners or other future projects that might uh, happen on these sites. So, you know, they're a real diary of what has been done and what we know about the site at that time as well, because, you know, sites are always changing, but and what threats then might become a problem in the future. So hopefully, you know, people can refer back to these and kind of have yeah, a path leading forward of how they might tackle what can has started. Uh, Right, so that, that's about it from CAN. If we go on to the next last slide here, just about. There we go, which is mainly just to say thank you. You know, thank you for inviting me into uh, give this talk. And I hope you learn something a bit more about peatlands and their biodiversity and why they're so important in our battle against climate change and just more about the CAN project and the work we're doing to monitor these vital habitats and their species. So yeah, if we just go on the last slide, then yeah, thank oh, you. Sorry. <laughs> oh, it's all right. It was just, you know, contact information there. If oh, anyone right. does want to go on the websites, that. that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. It was really fascinating. Yes. Do we have any questions for Ang Harrod? Yeah. Richard Reeve. Yeah. Um, I'm just a local resident around here and um, so we've got a, a large rhododendron a ponticum in our garden which is absolutely gorgeous of course um, and um, uh, we're seduced to do nothing about it because uh, it looks so nice for uh, most of August uh, but um, did, for the stem um, is it stem injection you mentioned does that do you need a license to do um to do that kind of work and the usual way of clearing would of any sort is to burn it and uh how, is uh, rhododendron generally a, a sort of wood that shouldn't be burnt because of what you were saying and the other little detail you could say is the um the rhododendrons you showed us in the um, peat bogs the small ones are they just pulled up 
um, you, you know, it's sufficiently small whereby you can get get a hold of them and and pull them up. And so, yeah, that's my question. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, yes, so right, I'll try and answer all all of those little bits. Um, yeah, unfortunately, the rhododendron does look very nice, <laughs> and I think that's yeah why a lot of people are swayed to to leave it. Um, so. Try, so the stem injection, yes, you do need a license to work with pesticides and like that. So all the contractors that we bring in are pesticide trained and also for any, you know, chainsaw work to kind of get paths in there. And yeah, rope access, as Marina was talking about, a lot of the time rhododendron is growing in very steep areas. So they need all the all the proper certificates to uh, to use that. Um, in terms of cutting down and burning, you can do that with rhododendron. Uh, I know a few projects that actually use the rhododendron to make charcoal then in kilns. So it's kind of a, a nice way of, you know, getting something out of it rather than, you know, just chopping it down because it needs to be chopped down is, you know, you're, yeah, you're getting something out of it. Then I always kind of wondered how that would work with art as well. If using uh, rhododendron charcoal could be used for that. I thought that would be a nice kind of cyclical, like bringing it all back together. Um, and then the small seedlings, yes, a lot of the time they're just hand pulled out if they're that small, which um, we've had uh, a volunteer, it's called the, the Bog Squad from Butterfly Conservation Scotland. They've come over to the CAM project a few times and a lot of the work they do for us is hand pulling out like tree seedlings, so conifer seedlings that are moving out onto the bogs and also rhododendron seedlings, kind of the two things that we don't really want growing out there. So yeah, some of them are easily enough kind of hand pulled. Some of the bigger ones might need spraying or chopping, chopping down. And then the, the stumps need to be treated as well when you chop them down. Uh, but yeah, I hope that's answered all your all your questions. Oh, Sarah, have you got something to add? Sarah? Yeah, I was just um there are there are there are other ways, but um the, the lever and mulch technique, I just wanted to mention that one as well. It's a really good one if you've got a team of volunteers doing and it's using hand tools. You don't need qualifications. It's hard work. It's hard physical work, but it's a good um, volunteer activity. And it involves just what it sounds like. You leave, you leave the stems quite long. Not every type of rhododendron growth is conducive to lever and mulch, but if you leave the stems quite long, you can work away at them and um, get them to come up. As long as you're taking out, uh, you're, you're below the point at which they go through the ground, because um, there's a point in the stem where they, they will throw out roots and you have to get below that and get all of that out. And, and it can be left it's unsightly to some, but it can be left if you turn it upside down with the roots in the air, it'll just um, die off. And again, it can be used for firewood. Um, but yeah, then, a lot of the, oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. just to jump in. A lot of the landowners use kind of any rhododendron that we, we've chopped down and a lot of them use it as firewood as well, you know, getting another benefit out of it. Sorry, anyway, go on, sorry. No, no, not at all. That's, um, that was it really. Uh, it, it, it does have poisonous, it is um, toxic, the smoke is toxic, but actually you have to consider that all wood smoke is toxic. Um, it doesn't mean to say that you'll get clean wood smoke from any other type of tree, so everything in moderation. It's burning the leaves of, of rhododendron and laurel. Uh, you just need to be aware of not breathing it in too much, but yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Do you have any more questions? Yeah. Hi there. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the conservation action plans and like who has accessibility to that. Because I'm working on a project uh, with an artist and we're specifically looking for as much information about bogs as possible. And like what, how, they, how deep are they? How they grow? What sites they're on? Um, and specifically in the west coast of Scotland. So I just wondered if there was like a like big database or or like how how to kind of get access to all of this like yeah wonderful information you've been talking about. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. 
Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so the conservation action plans that we're writing is mainly for kind of landowners and stakeholders, like interested stakeholders, obviously, because they do contain a lot of kind of information that maybe the landowners don't want being passed around to everyone. Uh, but if you're looking for more information about bogs, checking on the Nature Scott websites is really good. So they have a lot of information, kind of more information as well about peatland action then, which is doing a lot of the, the peatland restoration. But they also have quite a few really good maps. And I'm trying to remember the exact name of the website, but I'm sure we can pass it through Emma and get it to you. Uh, there's a website then that is kind of maps of all of Scotland and you can put so many different layers then on this map to show different habitat types, uh, different uh, areas of peatlands, that kind of thing. So that might be a really good idea if you're looking at trying to see where bogs are across, you know, Argyll or wider Scotland. Um, they also have information there then uh, from some of the peatland action surveys about you know how deep some of these uh, bogs are where they've been doing um, surveys and things like that so that would probably be quite a good good place to look then if you're wanting kind of an overview yeah of where a lot of these bogs are uh, otherwise i'm happy if you want to send questions over to me uh, we'll pass through my email and i can try and help you out as much as possible Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Yeah, of course. Hi, Angela Anderson, Plastic Tree Helmsborough. Um, can you tell me if you have some peat bog and you cover it over, does that preserve it or does that kill it? Thank you. Cover it over with what do you mean? Sorry. <laughs> um, a lot of boarding. Oh, okay. Um, so I suppose if you've got the boarding there, uh, it stops people walking on it, if that's kind of a concern, because that is, yeah, quite a big threat to a lot of bogs is kind of poaching by people or grazing animals, because that, again, disturbs all the moss, really turns it up and exposes the peat underneath. Um, I suppose if you're, you're just covering it over just, I don't know, it's, <laughs> I'm trying to imagine, like, what you're meaning here with quite big area to cover over with boards um obviously you want the the sphagnum mosses to be able to survive and all the vegetation below so you know if sunlight is still able to get through that should be all right like if it's kind of as i was saying boarding to stop things going on it and disturbing the peat that that's a good sign but yeah you also want the vegetation below it to be able to grow and to kind of you know keep that layer of sphagnum moss and keep everything under cover yeah is mainly trying to not let the peat get exposed to air. That's the main uh, concern really, is that's when it starts to release the carbon that it's storing. Uh, yeah, so I hope that kind of answers a bit, but let me know if you're <laughs> meaning anything else. Oh, Marina, yeah. Yeah, um, <clears throat> can you see this? Uh, there's a new publication. It was launched uh, during COP26 week in Glasgow by Clifton Bain. And it's a tour of the peatlands of Britain and Ireland and he did it uh, through green travel and um, it's actually a very useful publication I'm not promoting it but if, if you like something as a guide to peatlands it does a very good introduction and then it highlights some of the visits he did and how he got there in terms of his travel notes so there's some wonderful pictures uh, there's the Clyde mosses there if you can see the image, they've already in, all, all included some artwork, uh, art installations as well. So um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting read. And as I said, it was published just in November there for COP26 uh, events. So it's actually quite a handsome read. Mm. <laughs> I would highly recommend it. So I'm in the moment, um, I'm doing a pre see at the moment for the author. Um, and there's some amazing images and, and the photography is fantastic. Uh, I dare anybody not to pick it up if they get a copy. I, um, as I say, I got this, but I think it's about 20 pounds on Amazon. But anyway, Peatlands in Britain and Ireland, a traveler's guide. To find that, that looks great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll send the link across so uh, you, can, you can find it there. Okay, thank you. 
Um, and Garrett, I wondered if, um, I think move, following on from the question that you asked, Angela, where you have those bare patches of peatland, what do you do with them? Do you, can you reseed the sphagnum moss or do you, is there something else you can do there? Yeah, so a lot of this falls into the work that Peatland Action is doing, all this peatland restoration. So kind of bare areas uh, like that. So a lot of, on Isla, a lot of the exposed peat is bare siding from uh, like old peat diggings and that kind of thing. So how they address that then is to like reprofile the slope. So they kind of, they take a layer of vegetation off, kind of reprofile it, flatten out and replace the vegetation on top then just to cover up all that exposed peat. But then, you know, you've got your flatter areas of exposed peat. So like you said, yeah, you can plant sphagnum into that. Uh, so there's like little sphagnum plugs and uh, quite a few kind of interesting new innovations coming out of, with this as well. Quite a few companies kind of capitalizing on that peatland restoration is going to be quite a, a big thing for the next few years. So yeah, um, growing these sphagnum and you know providing them to be planted out there. Uh, you can also do it with heather as well, um, like seeding heather over these bare patches just to get that initial cover over it. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, that's mostly it really. Yeah, it's just a lot of reprofiling, putting in um, uh, peat dams and things like that to kind of re-wet the area, you know, cover it over with water. And then that'll help a lot of the, the really wet sphagnum mosses to grow through then. And just making sure that it's either covered by mosses, vegetation or water really. Uh, yeah, so the, the peat dams that's usually made either, you can use um, like plastic piling quite often or wooden dams put in or use the actual peat itself. Uh, so what they do is they, they kind of make like burrow pits so they, they borrow peat from one area and use that to plug up the ditch. And then that other area fills with water then. And we found actually with our, our project partners over in Ireland that these kind of borrow pits are actually full of waders. Then as soon as the, the water comes in, the, the wading birds absolutely love it. And, you know, dragonflies, all of those kind of things. So, um, yeah, you're not kind of creating another area of bare peat by, by taking some peat to, to put in for a peat dam. And uh, yeah, I think that's just about it. Um, that answers that question. Thank you. Any more? Yes, Alexia, you may. Pick up on what you were saying. So part of the, the um, our project is obviously bringing together ACT with um, with Cove Park and bringing artists together with scientists and specialists working in, in the environment and the climate crisis. And it's just so interesting to hear that you mentioned that um, it's actually one of our former residents, Lauren Galt, you're working with. And I just wondered if you could tell us a bit about that project. And Thank you, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so this project's been open in May in Ireland, and I've been working with the artist for around about six months. Um, she actually came along to the Climate Action and Migrate right, yeah, like, yes, group uh, back during COP. And um, yeah, where the bogs come in is really interesting. Part of her research has um, been looking into like bog butter, but bog findings over in Ireland. Um, and it's got a real connection with her, like, our, um, agricultural kind of past but also like the present and she's trying to really come to terms with like most of us um how these environments are um can actually exist together but also there's lots of other really interesting kind of um like pieces of research which are all connecting this so um as part of this project yes we've got the exhibition in may but towards the end of the year i've got some seed money from creative scotland to actually realize this uh, one specific artwork that is responding to bogs but also uh, to scarecrows to lots of other different materials um, and cite it in Scotland outside in a rural and remote location. Uh, specifically we are looking at bogs just purely because of a uh, that initial attraction to it the, as a site um, that can be all interchanging but have this real um, underneath like 
a language that not yet I could even understand. So I think that's part of um, that's going to be part of the work. And as like a curator, it's really important that I try and soak up all the knowledge from scientists and, and people who are working in this field, because I don't even want to say that I know anything about it. So hopefully that's a good enough expla like explanation, because I'm quite on the spot. But I think that uh, we're at the start of this first phase. And um, yes, by the end of the year, we're hoping to have like a an artwork on site that can respond to the actual environment and not like counteract against it. So yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we'd love to. Yeah, when, when I've actually got some visuals and it can be a bit more fancy. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. For Thank you. Talk. No, it's brilliant. Um, yeah. I'll hand back to Emma. That sounds really interesting. Yeah, brilliant. It's really, yeah, it's really nice to hear from people that are interpreting these this information all sorts of different ways. Um, have we got any more questions in the room? Or from panel on zoom no. okay well thank you very much and yeah like we said we can share um information if you want to email us if you want any more details from any of our speakers then please feel free um happy to pass on information if that's okay with you as well um but thank you very very much for for coming along and thank you to all our speakers for taking part it's been really interesting yeah, afternoon um yeah, it's me. me. Uh, I just want to, uh, wanted to add um, mm -hmm. just very briefly onto the end as part of the climate beacon, as part of our ongoing uh, work that we're doing partnership, um, collaborating with Cove Park. We've got a few other events coming up. Um, so there is that I think it's a, our next climate cafe is part of a tree planting event uh, mm -hmm. over there at, at Cove Park and uh, part of our um, Restoring Scotland's Rainforest project, uh, our, our forester Ian will be giving um, a talk on Scotland's rainforest. There'll be volunteering opportunities to help with planting trees and that's all taking place um, the weekend that starts with Friday the 18th of March through to the sa Saturday, the 18th and the 19th of March. Um, it's also part of your Year of Stories project and uh, the yes. Artists in Schools part of our Climate Beacon as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, Elaborate so on that. Yeah, there's lots of other things going on with our Climate Beacon. There's workshops and um, we have a, a film commission as well that started Artists in Schools and um, Year of Stories commission as well from a storyteller. So there's going to be, um, well, so we, we're going to have some more climate cafes similar to this, but on different themes. So please feel free to, to dip in and out as it suits you and to come along again next time. And obviously, if you do want to help us plant some trees, that would be marvellous. Because in the last count, there was about a thousand. <laughs> that seems quite daunting. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Sarah. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I think we can. Thank you, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>